Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Volume 2, issue number one from Mirage Studios. So this came out December 1993, and it is the first issue of Volume 2. I know we're already like, what, five, six issues into Volume 2, we haven't even gotten to number one yet. Well, now we have. So for anyone who's just jumping into this, and you haven't seen the, the previous stuff, basically, I am going to go through every issue of Volume 2 of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I am going to read each issue, and then I'm going to do a direct review of my thoughts immediately afterwards. So at this point in time, I've only read issue number one. I haven't read issue number two. Once I read issue number two, I'll do a quick video, and then I'll go and read issue number three, and so on and so on, until I'm all the way done. I'm going to be covering the main run, as well as the uh, spin-off non-canon side stuff, which is why you saw... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Flaming Carrot before this. I'm going to go by the date that it was released. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Flaming Carrot came out after issue number one, but it went issue number one, then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Flaming Carrots, issues number one and two, and then it goes to issue number two, Winds of Change of the main run. And rather than breaking up between main run flaming carrot i decided let's just do the flaming carrot right now just get it done and over with and then that way we can focus on the main run for a good while before it's time to jump to the next uh spin-off that's why uh the pacing is the way it is but yeah uh we're gonna stick with the main run for a good while at least for the next four or five issues according to the uh, cover dates that i'm seeing but uh enough rambling let's get right into this this is memories of the future very first issue of volume two it is a quick read. A lot of the um, pages don't have any dialogue. It's more of like a visual storytelling in this one. And another change you'll notice is that it's colorized. And this isn't like a color version of the series or anything like that. The entire volume two, they decided to go full color with the interiors. So volume one was black and white. And then of course you had um, some guest era stuff would be full color. The, Covers were always usually in color. There were color reprints, but other than that, like the original run was in black and white. But for volume two, that's when they introduced colors for the interior. So um, this isn't like a colorized version of volume two or anything like that. This is the original version. It's in color. And we start off with, I believe, which should be a flash of the future. We see Splinter and he's just all busted up and mangled. And then we see a turtle standing above him with bloody fists. Uh, we don't know who this turtle is. It could be Donatello. The reason why I say that is because we immediately cut to the actual present day of this series where Donatello is arriving to give some tea to Splinter who's resting. And Splinter explains that uh, we have to go to the Tori to today because a vision came to me in a dream. And I can't tell you exactly too much about what happened in the vision because I need to see more of it. And so we cut to the Tori where Splinter is showing Donatello and um, he tells him, like, you know, sit down, join me. And Donatello closes his eyes and he has a vision as well. And in his vision, he sees himself in the future and he's uh, in this village and the village is Chihaya, which is where Splinter was born. And in the village, he sees like a flying car and Donatello wakes up from the vision, he tells Splinter, like, I saw the future, I saw the small village. Splinter tells him, oh, that was Chihaya, that's where I'm born. And Donatello's like, why would I go there? And Splinter says, to bury me. And so, uh, yeah, I guess the uh, the vision Splinter had of someone killing him, it could be one of the turtles, it could be a fake out where the turtle that is seen over Splinter was fighting whoever attacked Splinter, and then afterwards, came to see how their father was doing and discovered him dead. We don't know. This is kind of like the whole mystery for this issue. What's going on with Splinter? Who killed him? Why is there a turtle with bloody fists standing above him? Like, what's going on there? And then we cut to Casey. And Casey is napping in front of the TV. And he has a dream where he sees a dark version of himself, super big and muscular with the hockey mask. And um, tells him, like, you know, wake up, daddy. Uh, you got a big day ahead of you. You know, I, I took Gabriel and now I've come back for Shadow. And, of course, Casey freaks out. He wakes up. He rushes to Shadow's room. Sees that she's doing okay. 
and April wakes up and you know hears a scream and asks him if he's okay. He's like, yeah, I just had a bad dream. And uh, April was like, well, I, maybe there was something in that pizza because I had a bad dream too. And she tells her story. And her story was that she was chased by Mausers in the sewers, which is kind of how she was introduced into the whole teenage run back in uh, volume two, which, volume one, issue number two. And as she's being chased by the Mausers, all of a sudden, Baxter Stockman saves her. He, like He grabs her hand and pulls her up. But Baxter Stockman is like kind of weird looking. Like He has a bunch of like wires and tubes all over his face. And um, yeah, they basically blame it on the pizza. And then that's when we cut to Raphael. Raphael is walking through the sewers when he hears something and he gives chase and he sees like this rope connecting from like one pipe to another off into the distance. And he sees a rat running on the rope. And for some reason, he decides to grab the rope and kind of give it a quick snap to knock the rat off into its death. Why? I don't know. <laughs> kind of a dick move, especially seeing as how your father is a rat. But he does this. He watches the rat fall. And then all of a sudden, the rope turns into a rat tail. And it turns out that Raphael is holding the tail of this giant rat that attacks him and throws him through a wall. And on the other side of that wall, we see Leonardo. And he's strapped to this table where he sees a Triceraton as well as a, another alien. I don't think I've seen this one before. I can't recall it from volume one. Um, but the alien's putting some kind of contraption on Leo's head. And then this says something in some kind of weird air, alien language. And then it pulls out what looks like this like syringe gun. And it ejects it into Leonardo. And then that's how it ends. <laughs> uh, like all of a sudden, it, it just goes like straight to like credits. And it's like just like weird credits, like associate unit, production manager, toaster unit. It's just like some kind of weird stuff. And then it shows like the uh, birth of man. I, I forgot what the name of that painting is. But it says like a Michelangelo production. And then Michelangelo flicks the TV off and it says the end. So I was like, was this all like a film that Michelangelo made? Like... I have no idea what the hell is going on here. This is just a really weird issue to start off with. And then after that, we get a tiny like mini story where we see this uh, cat uh, being chased down this, what looks like a lavatory. And there's these like soldiers with guns that are shooting at it. And um, they keep missing. The cat keeps dodging. And the people are like, you know, the, the thing says like, you know, the, the creature is going down to the lower levels and then, down to lower levels, it comes across this giant robot. I have no idea what this is about. I'm a little bit confused about that. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just like a really weird, trippy dream vision quest with the turtles that doesn't really make all that much sense. Kind of ends with, uh, like, was this all just in their heads? Like, what's going on? Was this all just part of Michelangelo's dream? Was it all a, a movie that he made? It's just, it's really weird. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about it. But just based off the first issue, I would say it's a weak start. I mean, obviously, volume one, issue one started off like fantastic. But then again, it was always kind of seen as a one shot. So, of course, it had more like of a co coherent story to go with it. And it had a beginning, middle and end and all that stuff. But even issue number two with Baxter Stockman and April O'Neil and stuff, was like a, a better start than this. This is just kind of just like really weird and trippy. And I don't really know how to feel about it. Kind of a weak start, but we'll see where it goes. So there you go. There's issue number one of volume two of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Memories of the Future came out December 1993. It was kind of a, a weaker uh, start. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of this, this opening for, for uh, volume two. But we'll, we'll see where it goes. Hopefully the next issue will be a lot better, a lot more coherence and and stuff uh i guess we'll find out anyways i hope you enjoyed and i hope to see you next time take care later